Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it must it must be strange to be sitting in a room full of people again. Uh, but it's uh, it's uh, good to see you all, even if I can't see all of your faces and all of your smiles. But it's nice to see people gathered once more. This, uh, as was mentioned, this is the first uh, live talk uh, here at the library since last October, so, uh, seven months or so. But this talk actually was originally scheduled for February, if I'm not mistaken, but it got postponed because of the, uh, the pandemic crisis in Hong Kong. So it's good to see we're through that. And it's good to see everybody uh, gathered here uh, uh, together. It's good to be back. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, I've been living here a long time now and coming in and out of here for many, many years, actually decades. And if you're an outsider like me to Hong Kong, one of the things you always wondered about is why it is that this city is so wealthy, but they have such extremes of poverty that you can see everywhere. It's a city where, you know, there was a parking space in mid-levels that sold for more than my last apartment in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a city where you see, you know, extremes of wealth, and you also see people sleeping in McDonald's or living on their tunnels or on walkway bridges. And uh, why that is in a city that has so much in terms of foreign exchange reserves is something that we're going to find out here from Professor Paul Yip. Uh, Professor Yip is Chair Professor of Population and Health at the Department of Social Work and Social Administration uh, in the Faculty of Social Sciences, where journalism is as well. He's the Associate Dean of Research at the faculty, and he's Director of the University's Center for Suicide Research and Prevention. He's also a prolific writer. Uh, I see his columns in South China Morning Post and elsewhere, writing about some of these uh, very issues here. In this book, uh, which you see on the screen here, Social Unrest and, Pover and the Poverty Problem in Hong Kong, Professor Yip tries to give you an in-depth analysis of the data on poverty, giving you a reference material on the situation here is analyzed by various groups, but it invites, or I might say challenges, different stakeholders in Hong Kong about how to deal with the poverty problem. So he's got a presentation here, I think it'll go maybe 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to have time afterwards for question and answers, including question and answers from all of you in the Zoom space. So if you're there, please put them in the chat box. If you're here, we'll come up, I'll come up afterwards and uh, we'll take Q&A. Um, I, I might have one or two questions, but I really hope all of you have questions for uh, Professor Yip. So without further ado, uh, Professor Paul Yip. We thank you for the kind introduction of Keith, and then um, we really look forward to for this talk. And then Tina has been very kind. I think you want me to do the book talk, but then I think because of the COVID, and it has been postponing and postponing. And then at the time, and then I met Fora, and then the librarian, and then we said, "Well, we have to do one." So, so now I think we are going to do it now. So I think as what Chief has mentioned. I think we have done Zoom for so long, we all suffer from somophobia. You know, I mean, we just don't know whether we talk to the people at all, you know, when we uh, hear the echo already, you know. So I think uh, today I'm very, very pleased, I mean, to have the audience here. And also I do know that there are some people, I think, on Zoom. Um, now I have to stand up to give my talk because I cannot sit and talk now. So anyway, um, that is the, what we like to do about the poverty. I mean, the poverty it is, it is not a new problem. And it's also not a, just a local problem. I think it is a global challenge. When I say it's a global challenge, you can see, I think in 1990, in, uh, in 2005, and then in the MDG, so-called the Millennium Development Goal, I mean, among the eight goals itself, I mean, the first one, they talk about directing the extreme poverty and hunger. So we have been, I mean, not only in Hong Kong, I think at a global level, and everybody is looking at this. And then they like to achieve it by 2015. And then, of course, I think um, that is the concern, I think, of everyone. So after we go to the, um, in the MDG, I think they talk about the irritated extreme poverty and hunger, it actually by 1990 and 2015, it actually the proposing income is less than it's already half. So we actually, I think they managed, I think, to bring to achieve this target I mean, well before. Of course, I think at this day, I mean now we're not talking about one dollar a day. What can you do with one dollar a day? So now what we do, and then we'll be looking at the end of the poverty, I mean we look at the proportion of people living in extreme poverty, decline by a half, and also we are talking about the people living less than $1.25 per day is also from 47% now to 22%.
But then when we talk about the SDG, I mean, that is from 2015, I mean, to 2013, poverty is still there. It still has not been fully solved. Now, because at that time, we, we talk about the, uh, the MDG, they talk about extreme poverty. But when we talk about the sustainable development goal, the poverty per se is not just the extreme poverty. We are talking about the poverty of being deprived of the opportunity to achieve what we want to do. They're talking about the deprived of the, of the opportunity I mean, to, to achieve I mean, a quality of life. So I think at this moment, I think when we talk about the 17 goal, I mean, poverty is still there. And I, I like this quote very much because when I, I, when I give this uh, course, I think to um, my second and third year student, I think this quote is from Nelson Mandela. They say that poverty is not an accident, like slavery and apartheid. Sometimes men make, or it could be women, right? So it's not only men. And it can be removed by the action of the human being. And then when Mother Teresa, I think she explained the poverty even better. It's talked about, we think that sometimes poverty is not only being hungry, naked, homeless, the poverty of being unwanted, unloved, uncareful is the greatest of the poverty. And we must start in our own homes to remedy this kind of poverty. And actually, uh, Aristotle, more than 2,000 years ago, the poverty is there, there, was there as well. The poverty is the parents of the revolution and crime. Sometimes when we try to understand some of the social problems, actually poverty could be one of the causes. And I also like Brian Stevenson, I think this, uh, the lawyer from the US lawyer, they say that the opposite of the poverty is not just wealth. Opposites of the poverty is justice. Sometimes it's the injustice in this society, I think, being forced, I think, the poverty in Hong Kong. So, how's the situation in Hong Kong? So, I'd like to bring you a latte index. I think one of the good things to come to Hong Kong, you, when you buy a latte in the Starbucks, you actually you are doing a good deal. You, know, you have a 30% off. You know, so, 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 you actually, if you, you like to come to the campus, try the latte, you actually is uh, cheaper than what you could have in downtown. But I'd like to bring the latte index to show it's a reflection of the income disparity and social mobility. What do I mean? We're looking at the latte price all over the world. See, in Australia, we all change it to the Hong Kong dollars, right? Okay, of course, there's some fluctuation in the, in the, in the foreign exchange. But roughly, it's talking about we have $24.3 dollars I mean, per, per latte in Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, Japan, and in Hong Kong, that's the $36. Dollars. This $36, dollars, we still have about 30% discount this, this here. When you come to Hong Kong, you, you only have to pay, I think, about 27 or 28. But then I put the minimum wages, the minimum wages in each city, how much uh, they can earn as a minimum wages. In Australia, it's about $112. And then you can see it. So when you look at this, in Hong Kong, the people, I mean, who work very hard, one hour of the minimum wages, you can afford to have one cup of blood. But when you work in the other country, you might have two, you might have 2.5, and then in Australia, you actually have a 4.5, right? Of course, then the people said, well, in Hong Kong, not everybody drink the drink, drink, drink latte, right? You can have the Hong Kong tea, but it doesn't matter. But it is just a, a illustration to demonstrate, I think, the situation. And if you like to make a graph, and then when you see if Hong Kong gives the preferences here, so this country under this segment is the one who have higher minimum wages than in Hong Kong. And also they actually, I think their cost of the latte is a bit more expensive. But as you can see, if this is as below this graph, it actually the affordability, I think for these places 
is better. So if you want to make a guess which city it is, right over there, that's the place which Latte is very expensive, but the minimum wages, they're very high as well. So. Amsterdam. Uh, close. Just the neighbors. That is in Zurich. <laughs> that is, well, I still remember when we go to Zurich, when you buy it, it's very expensive. Uh, but, but actually, when you ask the people, they, they actually they do earn uh, relatively. I mean, uh, they are better. So, what do you make of this? Now, that is even better. The minimum wages is higher, but their latte prices is actually is cheaper than Hong Kong. That is in San Francisco. Okay. So, and then, of course, this one is a bit more expensive, right? So, you have to not pay as much as in Hong Kong, but the price, I think, is more expensive, right? Oh, uh, yeah. This one is, is in mainland, right? That is in Beijing, right? I mean, the thing is, is quite expensive. And of course, and then you can see in New Delhi, and then we can see all this country. Now, actually, when you see this New York, Dublin, Wellington, Sydney, Paris, and all this country, I think they are the one who actually, in terms of the ratio, in terms of the Latin index, I think they are doing better, I think, than in Hong Kong. And unfortunately, I think uh, these are also these are the places which is now uh, the Hong Kong people, they might like to migrate there too. Um, when we're looking at this, we like to show you the happiness index, right? You know, there's a study called the World Happiness Index, and then we try to look at how do we like this map of happiness, I think, to the Latin index. And we show that, I think that's a happiness index, and then, well, it actually, it is not a linear curve. As so a lot of people feel that, well, if I have more money, I will be happy all, right? But it turns out that actually, I think the curve is a complex curve. So when the people, when they earn about 50,000 US dollars, actually the more you earn itself, I think the level of happiness is, does not increase as much as you wish. To a certain extent, which is true. I mean, once you meet your so-called certain minimum, and then the more you get, you might not be happy at all. So when you see, I think the country here, I mean, of course, when those people who are, who are, who, who are very deprived, who do not have a job, I mean, don't tell me they, are, they can be very happy, right? But you have to meet the so-called minimum. Right? But after you meet the minimum, they actually, you can see, I think the curve itself, it is in a complex function. Um, but when you do the Latin index, the happy index, it goes like this. So it actually, if I, use one minimum hours of working, and then if I have more latte, I actually am happier that way. But it doesn't mean that I do, I'm not trying to promote it to sell latte, no? but, but what I'm trying to say is that this, it is in this sort of relationship. So, my question is asked, <laughs> who steal my latte? <laughs> who steal my latte? <laughs> now, when you think about it, the price of the latte in Australia is not more expensive than in Hong Kong. Actually, they're cheaper. The quality is even better. <laughs> but the people who serve the latte, they actually, they are being paid at least three times more. Now, is this the rental cost? I guess everybody knows in Hong Kong the rental cost. Is it the people who run the business, the profit margin, they aim at a bit higher, or it's a bit of both? But my question is that, um, as Keith has said, you know, I mean, Hong, oh, Hong Kong, the GDP has been growing 8% in the 80s, in the 90s, and now, even up to now, we still enjoy 3 to 5% growth. But where has the wealth gone? Now, I don't have a solution. I just, one thing, what I do like to do is to sh share with you the data. I always say that let the data speak for themselves. 
Okay, and then you can come up with your own conclusion. You can have your own implication, and also you can come up with your own solution to the possible. So and now let's look at what happened is the local situation. Now we use the latest data, 2020, and then we look at the poverty situation. You see, I think the Hong Kong the poverty rate. I think we have a household size specific uh, disappropriate. Our poverty rate is defined using the relative poverty. Is who the number is the who earn less than fifty percent of the medium sum. Fifty percent of the medium sum. So what happened in twenty twenty? I think if one single household, I mean if you learn, earn less than four thousand four hundred, you can be classified. You're poor by definition, right? And then as it goes by, and then up to four or five household, and then you have um, uh, you have you you can earn less than twenty thousand dollars, and then you're poor. But one thing you have to remember: this is a relative poverty, so it is sustained. It is a statistical term. So whenever in any distribution, there are people who earn less than that amount, right? So if the whole distribution is way there, if everybody is earning $100,000, I don't mind. You know, 50% less than the media. I still have the money, right? I need to buy the latte, I need to enjoy the latte. But what happened, it is not quite true. And at the same time, it also so that it doesn't mean that when you earn more than four thousand four thousand and five hundred four hundred and five hundred dollars one hundred dollars more, you deem to be not poor, but it doesn't mean that your life is good, isn't it? So that poverty line itself is a kind of to show us. I think it's an indicating about the situation. I think of the income distribution in Hong Kong, and also you can think about hey, in Hong Kong this day. When you have that amount of money, what sort of quality of life you could have? $4,400. Okay. Well, then we can see the situation. I think we cannot bring anybody. I think the poverty rate, I think so called the pre intervention, and it goes up. I think we are, so we're talking about 23.6%. So really, one in five, one in five people, I think they are being poor. Uh, if I ask the people in the audience, do you feel you are poor? Yes, this, this is called subjective poor, okay? This is not objective poor. But it actually, we turn out that the subjective poor people, they are less happier than those people who are objective poor. So, so I think the mindset change is very important. Anyway, but what we are trying to say when we're looking at the differences here, that is to say how much cash take into the so-called post intervention, it bring down the uh, so-called poverty rate from 23.6% now to 7.9%. I always like to ask this question. When the government come to uh, say, hey, five years ago, you know, I will we only spend about uh, Thirty billion dollar, I think, in the social welfare. After so many years, now we spend more than a hundred billion dollars. So it shows our commitment. You know, I mean, to having the poor. But actually, if you use a different K the, the KPI, should we use that amount to measure the wellness, or to measure the effectiveness? I think to deal with the poverty in the society. If I need to use more money to bring it down to this one, that means there are people who are poor. So it, well, I always say that it is much better if they themselves can earn themselves, right? Rather than to demonstrate how much money I put into the social welfare to bring the thing down. Now, I'm not sure you agree with that, but, but at least from when we look at the data, it shows that those who have a job will have a very great impact, I think, to such that they will not be poor. So I think creating jobs, give them a decent salary, that is the most effective way 
I think the deep with the quality in Hong Kong is not just giving more, I think the cash uh, subsidy, the CSSA, the, I don't mean that they are wrong, it's good that they do it. But at the same time, I think when we have to look at the poverty problem, we have to deal with some sort of structural problem that we have to deal with. Okay, now that is, uh, we call the CSSA, OALA, OAA, and the, they actually, I think our government is really a caring government. I'm serious. They do spend a lot of money. But my question is that, are we spending the money effectively? Can we be deployed these sort of resources in some way that can be more effectively, I think, to address the poverty problem in Hong Kong? Now, as you know, I think the poverty number, and as it goes by, I think, in 2018, 19, and 20, the rate go up, the number of people goes up, right? But actually, um, when we do a decomposition analysis, now, I mean, uh, although it is the it's a given name, I'd like to show you some mathematics, right? <laughs> although it's a bit late for that, but, but we have a fixed rate. If the population size increases, the number of people poor, of course, is it's going to go up, right? Given with no real changes in the property rate. So that's why, but what we like to demonstrate is just to highlight these changes from 21% to 23.6%. What are the causes? Now, it actually, there are three causes. One is the population size. Two is the age distribution. Three is the household side composition. As you know, the household side is one of the major factors I mean, to determine the poverty. And of course, the household and age specific poverty rate actually details the target that we would like to improve, right? So, what we have seen, if you compare the 2020 and 2019, you see actually most of the contribution is nothing to do with the aging, it has nothing to do with the household size. It actually, the people are genuinely they are poor comparing with 2019. If you look at 2019 to 2018, we actually the differences from 20.43, and it also, we are seeing the worsening situation, I think, of the poverty situation in the community. That cannot be explained by the aging population, by the increasing number of the smaller households. So we are dealing with some genuine problems and we need to have effective solution. I mean, to address it. Okay, so uh, you can see the size from 1.6 million, I think going up from 1.3 million to 1.6 million. And uh, that is deal with the aging and then the household size, the whole population growth, and these are the poverty rates. So out of the differences of this so-called 30, uh, 300,000, I and mean, they are this amount they're being contributed by the worsening of the poverty situation in the community. Okay, now I just like to bring it back 30 years ago. What happened now, in Hong Kong, 1991? I'm sure some of you have been born, yes, some of you have not been born, right? 1991, the medium household income is about $10,000. In 2001, and then how much you earn? 18,000. So it's gone up by nearly 100%. But when you look at 2001 to 2011, what happened? I think it just gone up by less than $2,000. 10 years. Even with the big discount, I mean, in our student canteen, you know, I mean, uh, it still cannot catch up the rate of, G, the rate of increase. Now, these are the numbers. So sometimes if we ask why the people they get angry, well, you can see if we work for 10 years and then if the wages doesn't go down, who won't be angry, right? So, and then you can see the proportion of the owner occupying household, less than 40, 43%, 29%, 20%. And now you can see there's a big trend that's the adults, they prefer to stay at home rather than move out. Actually, when I asked my son, I mean, 
we still like him to stay with us. But he actually, no, I want to stay with you because I just cannot afford it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the fact, right? That things are very expensive. They cannot move out. Right? So, but the thing is that we are not only talking about if you divide the income distribution from 10, 10, 10 groups, that is the top 10%, that's the bottom 10, you look at this. At the top 10% is still growing. It's still growing. And that is still growing. But I think this middle part doesn't grow. They just stay there. So that's what we call the m shaped society. It's the disappearing of this middle group. So the rich, you actually, you are doing good. But the not so rich, you are hanging on there, but the poor one, they, they are struggling. They are struggling. So what I really like to see that if we see the whole thing, this I say, if the economic development, it brings the benefit to all the people, well, most, if not all. Right? But apparently, I think when you're looking at the past 20 years or so, I think we are still talking about, I think it's like the top 20%. I think they are the fortunate one. Unfortunately, or fortunately, somehow uh, we might be, we are here, but sometimes we might forget or we overlooked. I think those people who might not be as fortunate as, fortunate as us. Um, that is the income growth. Uh, so you see, 1996, 201. 206, 2011. Right. So it is not only a statistical figure, it is the real number that actually you can see the people, they do not, they have not improved their income, they, uh, they are young. And then they, for this one, I mean, you still go up. Uh, okay, so. Um, I'd like to show you that there's the income when you see 1991, 201, and then when you're 201 and 2011, it actually, there is a reduction of the salary. Not only to talk about the improvement, but when you look at the property index, you can see why in 1991 and 201, those people, they still can afford an apartment because I think the salary right is that much, the property right is that much, but in 1991 and 201, it's gone right through the roof. I think that is the situation. That is the data. Please look at the data and then try to see whether somewhere, someplace that it has gone wrong. Um, when we're looking at um, different kind of industry, factoring, construction, transport, I still remember in 1991, and then uh, there is a Chinese saying, uh, don't you know I mean, with those people who cannot do well in the study, and then they can drive the trucks or the lorry, the, the, the cross border. And that's why they have the uh, so called the second wife villages. They over there. <laughs> but those people, they are earning about 30 or $40,000 in 1991. But the same guy who was still doing the truck driver now. If they're lucky, if they have jobs, I mean, they're still earning about ten or twenty thousand dollars. So you can see, I think that is the changes. That is the changes. Um, you can see in Hong Kong, I mean, the whole industry has been changing. Manufacturing is getting smaller. Construction is still there, and then, but it actually, you can see the profession, the people, there's still not much change. The whole ecology, the landscape. I think we still have that amount of people. So one thing we always say that, hey, when you say increase the mobility of the young people, you have to give them the opportunity. You have to widen the, the, the economic activities. You have to, you can provide sufficient opportunity for them, I mean, to be able to try. But unfortunately, I think we are still very, very um, not, expanding as much as we could. Now our university, I mean, we take in more students, but I think the job at the management level is still remains more or less like this. 
So it actually, they can see that's the bottleneck and then they cannot go through. Um, I think that is, I really like this, this data. This data is telling you to, uh, 2012 and 2013, and then it is 40% of the taxpayer paying over 80% of the total sales tax. 40%, 18 tax. So um, uh, we, have, we have to fill in the tax return. Right? We have to pay tax, right? So, but what you can see, for those people who earn less than $400,000, it actually is contributed to Hong Kong, I think less than 10% of the tax. But it actually, it represents 80, 60 or 70% of the working population. And for those people who do not pay tax, oh, it's a good thing, you know, they should pay more. Yes, it is true. However, I would like to see more people who can pay tax. One, your tax rate is as wider and more stable. Two, that means the people that earned in love to, to pay tax. But now in Hong Kong, our wages are so low, has been kept so low, that they do not have to pay tax. So I always say when I pay tax, I feel good because I earned enough that I need to pay tax. But actually, that is a very, very not healthy situation. Now, when there's a, when these people who are earning more than one million dollars, if they are going to leave Hong Kong, what happened to our system? We're not very stable. And at the same time, if I were the financial secretary, I would more than happy to waive ten percent of the people they don't have to pay tax. It actually it has so little impact to my tax income that it make half of the working population happy. It's a good deal. It's as much better than give the ten thousand dollars. That amount has to pay is the so small. Similarly, it's about when we're looking at. The situation in 2018, the situation just gets worse. <laughs> just gets worse. 10% of people paying 80% of the tax now instead of 70%. Now that is being reflected from the data. So the data doesn't lie. It just really tells you the income disparity is just getting wider and wider. Also, looking at this profit tax uh, income, when you earn money, you pay that. In 2012 to 2013, 1% of the corporation, they pay 60% of the profit tax. So, as I said, any company who earn less than $5 million, I think it's actually 10%, but it represents, I think, 57% of the, of the whole cooperation, the whole corporation. So actually, we can waive this uh, tax, but we need to impact on this. And in 2018, what happened? It's gone up to 70 percent. So you, and then I start to understand why, uh, why the why the government is very concerned about this big company when they go. It actually, yes, they do have a big impact on it. But I think this is so unequal distribution. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. All right, now this is the data a bit outdated. It's about the income disparity between the so-called uh, in the government forces, I mean the lowest one and the highest one. When you just uh, look at the recent pay trend survey, <laughs> the higher one pays 7.5% percent, the low one pay 1%. So when you reapply this, you just make this range even larger and larger. So actually, you're reinforcing this or in the income disparity in our system. All right. So I will say that there's the deep structural problem. The wages, for some people, too low. For some people, are always too high. I don't know why they have the, why, why, why they deserve to pay so much. But I think for the low income, they do pay too low. And the taxation is very highly concentrated. I still remember, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, when they 
try to talk about the sales tax you know, when they try to promote this. It has a lot of opposition. At that time, why there's so much opposition? Because they say, that, well, the company has so much money already. Why do you have to introduce the sales tax? Right? And actually, I thought if they, if they bring in the sales tax, uh, then you can redistribute some sort of the, the company. That's a tax system. It, it would be a good thing. But however, I think what we're talking about, we have to ensure the local, the common, ordinary wages earner, they should earn sufficient enough I think to make their due contribution. Um, I'll actually, in the book, it actually there are many, many topics. So I'd like to bring you a few things to cheer a bit. We look at the uh, spatial distribution. Now, what is the spatial distribution? I think in Hong Kong, although it's not a very big place, we have a thousand uh, square kilometers, but it actually there's a lot of differences, there's a lot of heterogeneity. We have identified there are seven poverty clusters. Okay, that is the Yunnan North East, Yunnan Northwest, Timur. So all are this in the northwestern district. Now, if you remember, well, I don't think you can remember when you are that young, but when I think twenty or thirty or forty years ago, when they start to uh, move the people to this area, the transport is not available. The system is not there yet. So I think this West Well and all this thing, it just put in force, I think, in the last three or five years. But at that time, there's a lot of people, I think they stay there, they're more they've been trapped there. They've been trapped there. And why the people moving there? Because relatively the rent is cheaper, so they can more affordable. But at the same time, when you're being trapped there, if you do not have job opportunities here, and then the transport cost is so expensive, but people need to get out to work, and then you build up self, that sort of custody. But even so, I think in the inner custody, we also have social role, and then we have um, the Wong Dai Si, and then that is the Chimon, uh, and these are, we have shown, they have relatively more people, I think. Now. At the same time, when we look at this service provision, now when I, if I were poor, what do I expect? I hope I can be better supported, right? Unfortunately, I think when we look, when we use the GIS to look at the service provision, it actually, these so-called the poverty cluster, they are being poorly served. So you see that is like a spiral down thing. I am poor already, but what sort of deprivation they talk about? The food retail, health services, the transport, the transport is always in this area. Right? So I think hopefully now we have the Western Rail, and, and that is good. And uh, I think I hope the Lofton Metropolis it takes place well, which the people can live there, can work there. It's a good thing, right? If it is successful. Okay. So we're also looking at this. The multiple deprivation, I think that is the so called inner city, the this of area. But why do we do this GIS? Because what we like to build, to, if you really want to tackle the poverty, you have to know who are the people who are poor and what sort of thing they need. For example, when you, you can see this, I think we're talking about um, um, uh, the new arrival. You can see the new arrival single grid. So I would like to create more childcare center there. Because if I create more childcare center there, then the, I think the women's room, they would increase the women's production rate, and they release the women's workforce, they can participate in. I would not build a childcare center in here because in some people, because there's a lot of elderly there, they do not need a childcare center. So I think by, by looking at the data, and hopefully it can guide us to do more effective poverty alleviation. Also, we like to look at this. We're looking at the young people, where do they live and what do, and where do they work? Now, um, we're looking at young Jimbo. Um, these young people, I mean, the young Jimbo, there's a lot of people working there, but they are very 
few people, they are living there. Now, when you can see, that is to see the mismatch of the jobs and the job surprise and the job, the need. So what we see, there's a lot of people are living there, but they have to do a lot of travel. I mean, to go there to work. So that's why every morning at seven o'clock, eight o'clock, there's so many people going to KCR, going to the bus, and then because they have the cost of this way, the find jobs. That's why we ever do very busy. I have one of the very uh, not so good story. It's about there's a lady who lives in Tumun who find a job in the Chinese restaurant making dim sum. I mean, they, she has to get up at over four or five, take the first bus, and then to cross the district, to go to Wan Jai, and then to make the dim sum for us. But then she actually she can do the same thing in Tumun. But there are not enough jobs there. But when they when, when she's going to cross so far, traveling to take at least 1.5 hours each way, I mean, they do the job here. She actually she earning about 3,000 more. But we never take that into the consideration. In the equation, the time, she used her own time to earn this $3,000 more, three hours. And the expenses of the family, and, and the expenses of their own health. But Hong Kong people are so hardworking. They are prepared. They travel for so much just for that amount of money. So I think when we talk about this, we really have to think about are we doing the right thing? Are we missing something? So um, uh, we also look at a new town. And so once again, I uh, think you. You, you can see there's a big mismatch there. And that's why I think it's just much better. I think if we can. So I think what we heard about this North Metropolis, I think it's very exciting. Send the people to work, work there, live there. It will save a lot of time and will improve the quality of living. Um, when we do the GIS, we have cluster distances. And then, so we, once we do the GIS, we work with the NGOs, go there to create a job opportunity in Bay. I think that is very important. And also, um, as well, I'm working for the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention, the poverty it actually is related to the suicidal risk too. I mean, that the poor people can do relatively, they have a high risk. We look at the data, the top 10, the top 20%, the bottom 20%, the bottom 20% are 2.5 times higher than the top 20%. That accessory happened for 10 to 44 years old, 45 to 64. For the elderly, actually, I mean, the wages differential is just much smaller. Uh, it doesn't mean that the rich people, they will not kill themselves. Rich people, they too kill themselves too. But very typically speaking, I mean, for the deprived folk, I think their risk is higher. Okay. So, um, uh, pop forum is very cheap safe. Okay. The pop forum is not. Uh, and then we can see uh, that there's in Taiwan, in some sort of bowl, and then in the northern district. Uh, you can see the northern district, the northwest district, still have a high risk. All right. So, how much time I have? Just... 20. 20. Thank you. All right, so we talk about the mismatch. If you if like to create a sustainable community to live and work, I think we need to redeploy the, the resources, I think, to the needy population. I always say the people they live in the Central and Western District. They are very lucky. They have a swimming pool in Second Joy. They have a swimming pool in Sao you know, Less than one kilometer. You have two big swimming pools. But don't worry, there's no lifeguard. <laughs> not enough. Not enough lifeguards. But it actually, there are people who live in that area. They're not that deprived. They're more abundantly surprised. We don't show you still don't have a gym for you. 
So, okay. Um, challenges, aging population, diminishing working population, co-creation is very important. I always think that don't expect the government to do everything. It's a time that we, we ourselves can do something and also work with the work with the business partner. I can see now there's a lot of company and they, they go to the CSR and some of the startup, those, uh, those uh, business model done by the SIG, the Social Innovation Fund. They are the one. I think will come up and try to solve, I think, the social problem. And I always say that we defining the Hong Kong position. Who are we? Where are we? I think in this new chapter now, I think what is our position? How can we maintain the uniqueness of Hong Kong to make contribution to our country? How can we make ourselves, I mean, to prepare ourselves, I mean, not to be a burden, but rather than really trying to, to help? I think that is we have to identify or we have to redefine our role. Uh, aging. Now, 1961. Um, of the years here. So, if you were 1961, you are somewhere here, right? Yeah, you are somewhere here. <laughs> so, so, you see, that is the aging. The aging, that is 61. I was born in the 60s. So, you can see it all goes up. It goes up very fast. It goes up very fast. 2031, 2041. What does it look like? It's like a, like a Toronto, like a heritage. When it right through, it goes damaged. Now, if I do not want to see, well, I'm not sure 2051, how many of us are still there. Well, if God allows, we are still around, but we are here. But you can see the population is not very, very healthy, very infant. But what I like to see is that, hey, the government always talk about population policy. Now, if you do not want to see this, what do you do? You do, you do not wait until 2051 and say, oh, we have the problem. You know, we have to deal with it. You have to do it now to prevent it, to get to there, right? I mean, this is a population projection. It doesn't have to be true because this population projection is only based on the assumption, present migration, the birth and death, and then that is what is going to go. There's no crystal ball. It's a mathematic equation. Everybody can do it. You can see that. But if you change some of the parameters, like what happened in Hong Kong in the past two years, our number of death, our number, number of birth. So we have a natural negative growth. What happened? Our populations come down. Fortunately, we have migration to replace our migration. What happened? Now, our migration is much more than the in-migration. So we suffer from double trend. So we do not give enough baby until we are losing the people from the migration. So the population size in the past two years, it actually is just coming down. So which is less than what the government forecast in 2018. Because in 2018, when they do the so-called 50 years forecast, there's no social unrest, there's no COVID, I mean, uh, so, so the population still expect to go this. But now, in the last two years, it actually has come down. Like, is going to bounce up? I don't know. I don't know. It depends on the policy. It depends on what we do to retain the people here, to get the people to have more babies, or to stop the people to die. There's only three things you can do, right? But none of them, they're easy. Ask the people to give birth, push a luck. I mean, uh, the, when we say we ask our young student I mean, to, to get married earlier, no, they're getting later, have more babies, no, I think. And now I think what most likely we could achieve is to bring the people in or to slow down the net migration. I think that might be something that we have to work on. Okay, so. Um, it doesn't look good. I think the our public society going now, the people who are working will be less. And who's paying the tax? Actually, most of them we are not paying the tax anyway. So where the money comes from? Doesn't fall from the sky or go from the tree. 
Some I have to pay for. There's no free lunch. And you can see the population projection, even the so-called GDP growth, is a lot because offset by the aging. Even in mainland China now, of the aging, it actually it has an impact to the GDP growth. So they have originally the project is 8%, now come down to 5%, and now they are talking about if you are lucky, we stay positive. So the sheer force of the population dynamics, it actually has a substantial impact, I think, of the economic development. Now, I'd like to highlight uh, in this room, I don't know how many of you, you are between 15 to 25. Not even, yes, I have one. <laughs> now, I think try to be more empathetic to them. You know what happened to them? There's so many people sitting on them. There are not many people below them. So they are actually, they are, they are the one who suffer. We are not dying, sorry, I shouldn't say we are not dying fast enough. <laughs> or to create opportunity to them. But at the same time, if you don't produce enough babies, I mean, to create the job opportunities too. And they are the one who have to struggle through. But when they are getting there, they are tired, they're exhausted. So I just hope that I think when they looking at the population distribution, we can be more supportive to our young people. I mean, for those we are somewhere here, I think we enjoy the golden period. There's a lot of opportunity. There's still not many people. Uh, there's a lot of jobs. I think uh, we enjoy this sort of group. But I think for the young people who are struggling here, they need our help. They need our help. And actually, at the end of the day, if you can help them well, they are going to help us now. So. Um, yes, I say that the population size go from 3.4, 3.1, 3.9, 3.7 is going down, down, down. But now we are 2.7 plus a dog or plus a cat. So, so they will prefer to have dogs or cats, I think, as their siblings. Um, I, I took this picture in Cyberport. You know, there's a dog's garden there, right? So I think. Uh, uh, the rest of us, I mean, there are two children. I mean, the Chinese couple, there are two dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I went to UK, I mean, three years ago, when we still allowed to travel in Bristol, Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning, we have three ladies, many babies, and many dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we must be missing something. We must be missing something in our society. Now, our GDP is not less than in UK. Of course, they have much more space, but there's somehow we are missing something. Um, I like to show the total fertility rate. We all say that that's like the um, that is the glass floor and this glass ceiling. What I mean. Singapore, Japan, this high income country, high income Asian country. It doesn't matter what we do, our fertility rate is still remain at about one to one point three. Actually, if you know in Hong in Hong Kong, the last year the TFL is only 0.774. It's well below the 2.1 replacement level. So but in US and then they somehow whatever they do, you know, they do not fall below that. So they manage. So then we start to ask, hey, how come in the Western country they do the women on average they produce about 1.7 to 2.0 babies? I mean, in Asia, are we working too hard? I think we're working too hard. You know, we do not have enough time to make babies, right? <laughs> and then we do not have space right? to look after the babies, right? I mean, these are the problems, these are the structural problems I think we have to deal with. So it's how to promote the friendly, friendly. Working, um, working among this is also very deep to point. So I'd like to, uh, in the rest of the time, five minutes, okay, so I'm going to finish it. I think because they, I always say that the sun come out like today, everybody is happy, but when it rains, 
think the men like us, we never bring umbrella, so forget it. But I think in the neighborhood, if there's some umbrella, then keep us dry. So I always say that not everybody is very fortunate. Even if I cannot improve my, my situation, but if I can uh, leverage on the support from the community. So I will not go through this. I think this is extension of the retirement age. That is uh, something to keep the people working, educating and training, one million permanent holders, minimum wages, outsourcing. These are three problems. Public housing, childcare services, social innovation and co-creation with the business, and the economic drivers, the, the economy diversification and stuff. Just show you, without doing anything, if you improve the, the retirement age, you are widening your window of opportunity. You still can maintain more workforce in your community. It's a good thing. So if they do not produce baby, then you keep the people, but you give them a choice. Don't force them to work. I think they like to work, give them a chance to work. I also like to see, provide the education training. I mean, it really is important. That is the picture in Bristol too. I see the young man, age 26, he has a dog, he has a job, he has a girlfriend, he has a, an apartment. I mean, in, in Hong Kong, you can, those people who work in this, but don't know, they have nothing. I think there must be some sort of wages. Of course, when we go to this restaurant, that we do, you, have, you have to pay more. Okay. I always say that the ladder is there, the ladder is still there, but the gap is high, it's wider, making it more difficult to work. You can see the wages. That is in 201. In 2011, all this salary has actually pushed down. We are talking about the young graduate. So the graduate 10 years ago, they earned even more than the graduates now. There must be something wrong, right? There must be something wrong. So I sometimes I really uh, can feel the frustration of some of our young people. You know, I think so. so. Um, without the one-way permit holder, the situation is worse. So you need, so a lot of people, they complain about, well, why do you put so many people here? But if we don't have them, I mean, we have most closure of the kindergarten and all this. Um, a lot of people, they say that, well, they employ this. But why we cannot do this? Then the people go, oh, if you take away their job, they have nothing to do. That's not an excuse. We should provide the on-job training. Do something else. I mean, this, these people, they are not young. They still have to do this heavy lifting. It is bad for them. It's bad for us. So, um, housing of mobility. You can see in Hong Kong, here, 23 years, no eating, no dining, nothing. And then you pay for 23 years, pay for medium house. That is the situation. But one thing I do like to highlight is as a public housing. For those people, I think if you are in the public housing, it actually you can save money. Even if you own the house, you actually you might not save it. So I think the public housing play a very important role to well-being in Hong Kong. I do like to see the new government we can promote more public housing affordability into the Hong Kong people. I like to see this end price. I mean, here's the one. I think who promote the 70,000 US dollar for the minimum wages for the people who work in his company. I think we like to have more responsible scene, share the wealth, co-creation, co-sharing. Um, I'd like to finish this. You know what is this? I mean, for the non-local people, do you understand this? You know what does, what does this stand for? This is a Chinese saying, you use a glass of water and then you like to put off the fire. I say, well, the government tell you, I have given you six glasses of water. Does it put off the fire? It doesn't, right? So we have to think out of the box. But it is good that we think about this. I remember I gave this talk to a young people, you know, where they, what they say, they go straight over, you know, we, we, the water and the fire don't mix. <laughs> You know, we are talking about I mean, it's just 
So I think the poverty is just the tip of the iceberg. We need to really to make the iceberg small and then we really have to work hard. I mean, to improve the environment. So I like to look at this graph. I think the population health moved the sugar, moved the well being of the population. I think you're left, left people. So now we spend a lot of money to fund this school. No, shift the population. The whole population will be better. Um, I like to see this. So one thing, calm down. You can see this um, inspiration for this is a film in the Netflix. I think in Hong Kong, what we need now, leadership, hope, prosperity, and generosity. Now, this film is done by General Eisenman. He is a startup. He, he funds the whole project, identifies three people to go to the space with him. And then what he likes to do, he likes to get the ordinary people an opportunity to participate. So I think when Hong Kong can solve the poverty problem, we do need leadership. We need to induce a hope in the population. We need to prosperity. Someone has to have money. If you have no money, how do we do it? And then generosity. When you have money, don't keep it for yourself. Okay? Share with God. Does it look good? It's look good, isn't it? Inspiration. Space. Induce hope. So um, I'm going to finish this. That is something I think we need ownership and we need lynch. The poverty cannot be solved. If we do not take the commitment, I think, to take the ownership of the problem and show some leadership. Thank you. And for the participants on Zoom, you can uh, key in your questions and um, we will uh, try to answer you uh, in detail. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Please use the mic. Huh. Can I take you from your lactate index to the TBA code skinny coefficient? At 53.9, our skinny coefficient is probably the highest, well, nearly the highest in the world, surpassed only by a few very, very poor countries. So, from that point of view, we already see there must be a problem, it must be only a, a, a problem in policy because it's had nothing to do with Hong Kong's natural endowment. And uh, I like your quotes from Stevenson and Aristotle. So clearly, this is a problem of insubstance, as, as, you, as you quoted from Stevenson. And then <clears throat> As uh, we learned from Aristotle, uh, in, in, in 2019, when over a million people take to the streets, uh, could, it be, could it be explained somehow by, by our increasing and very high GDP coefficient? Now, when it comes to how to alleviate uh, poverty or, or this income disparity, um, Taxation is always <clears throat> not a very popular one, but uh, I I like to highlight perhaps uh, it could be uh, to diversify the economy and in increasing education. Uh, the the economy is is now almost sort of too unitary. Uh, there is a there is hardly any manufacturing and. And many jobs are just not there. So we need to have a diversified economy in order to improve job mobility. And that's the way to, to, to people to improve their life and overcome, overcome poverty. The other thing is uh, uh, education. I think we need much more university education. Our participation rate in university education 
is only about 30 percent. Well, depending on how you count, uh, uh, if, you, if you consider the 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 the, 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 the real universe. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's only about 30 percent. That's very very low. And what we need is that kind of education. We need university graduates who will be able to start companies who will help diversify the, the, the economy. And uh, you know, and education is also the key to. I I'd like to sort of just follow up two aspects about we mentioned about population that uh, we have about the lowest birth rate in the world, and. If there's a, there's a better education system, perhaps people would like to have more children. Now, the other the last comment I'd like to, to make is that perhaps uh, is, is uh, universal in tune of the neighboring population is really an excuse because every, every place, this is happening everywhere. So Hong Kong is actually not worse than in the mainland or, in, or, or, or Japan. So, so you, you can't blame everything on, on the, the people's population. Uh, perhaps I have to stop there. Well, can I make some comments on that? Well, and, uh, I think your comment is valid. I think um, um, when you mentioned about the Gini coefficient, yes, I think uh, the Gini coefficient is always Hong Kong is at a historical height. And actually, as I said, uh, I think some of the frustration thing is really arising, I think, from the income distribution. I mean, as I showed you the numbers, I mean, how come I mean, 10 years later, so the, the graduate they actually can earn less than you know, 10 years uh, before? But of course, I mean, the, the, the sort of movement that happened, a little complicated uh, things. I think Happenings, but at the same time, I always say that uh, we look forward to how it can be. Uh, we build our society. I think one of the problems that we have to address, I think, it is the uh, the well-being of our young people. We, instead of complaining them, they lay threats. You know, it is, it is you have to give them hope. You have to give them opportunities and to develop. I mean, that is. I think that is our job now. This is, this is, so um, yes, I think. But... And, and the uh, the aging population is questionable. Are we worse off in Hong Kong than they are in in mainland China or Japan or elsewhere? Yes, I think um, our aging is aging very fast. But as I said before, Hong Kong is just a part of the now the Greater Bay Area now. So I think if you take a wide a wider perspective, I think the situation might not be that bad. However. At this moment, we still have to face this sort of situation. I mean, we're still talking about 21% of the people age 65 or above. I mean, these are also I think, quite a substantial burden, I think, to the uh, public finance purse, I think, in terms of the social welfare. So even now, the $2 concession, now we are so happy about this. Now. But you know, it has gone from, 300 million now is going up to 640 million dollars. So the rate, I think, is just goes zoom up, is going up the roof now. So actually, it is something that uh, we might underestimate or underappreciate the consequences of the aging. I mean, we always think about, oh, we still have a lot of money in the, in the reserve. It doesn't last long. Now we so if you do not work hard, I think to maintain that, I think uh, that will be different. Yeah, can I ask on that topic, can I ask about the uh, people not having enough babies? Because when I ask people that question, the first thing I hear is always, it's too expensive to have children. Uh, when I lived in France, it's one of the few countries in Europe where they actually have a strong birth rate. And the reason is the French government actually gives you long periods of time off paid, uh, they have this thing called nursery school or crash in France that's free. Uh, you get tax breaks for more children. Should they be looking at things like that in Hong Kong? Well, I think one thing uh, we have to accept, uh, have a smaller family size is really the law of the modern society. It doesn't matter in France or India. But I think in Hong Kong, it is so acutely low 
which is unusual. Uh, I will, I'm serving as a member of the Family Planning Association. Usually we ask a question about the um, your ideal number of children you would like to have and the actual number of children you have. Yeah, actually there is a gap. There's a gap. There is about 30 or 40% of the women who like to have more baby, but somehow they have to make a compromise because of the work, because of the living space, because of the cause, because of the responsibility to become a parent this day, you know, and then which become the barriers for, I think, for them to have more people. So I think it's not only just money. I mean, if the money, well, money is good, money can help, but I think you really need a holistic support, I think, for the women. And then if you want them to have, uh, to have babies. Now, they do not get married, they marry late, and then they have less to, it's a, we have to live with it. So somehow, how do we increase our productivity, our productivity and how to work smarter, and how to bring in more migrants to do the replacement migration. I think that this is something that we have to do with. And the migrants can come from anywhere? Of course, anywhere? of course. I think, I think, I think, you know, what, I think the one thing, when you go to, when you go to London, I, mean, I was told that only 40% of the people I mean, they were born in UK. They live in London, all from Europe, from other places. That make the city, I think, more vibrant, more diversity, and more attractive. Interesting. And I'm just curious because the title of your book is Social Unrest and the Poverty Problem in Hong Kong. So do you see that there's a potential that if they don't solve this problem, there's going to be more discontent? Well, I think that the, the people that have discontent. I mean, uh, whether they show it as the actual demonstration or the protest, I think it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's way to see, but because I think uh, I think in 2019, I think we're very unfortunate. I, I, I mean, some of the young people, uh, they, uh, they were involved in this, and then somehow, I think, um, when they do this, some of them, um, uh, they really out of the love of, of Hong Kong. They feel that there's something injustice, so they participate. But of course, now they know that they've done something wrong. It's not the right way to express your frustration in this way, which is good. But at the same time, I still think that we still have to address, I think, the causes of the discontent. I mean, if we just sweep under the carpet, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, that's just not very good. What would you be happy when you have someone to live in the place if everybody is not happy, whether they're young or they're old, you know, then the place is not a very happy place. So I think it's tackle on. I mean, yes, what is your concern? In the wages, youth mobility, education opportunities, these are the real thing. I mean, even put it in other countries, they will be demonstrated. In France, they did they will demonstrate, right? So, so, so I just hope that we can be a bit more uh, supportive, I mean, to our young people. They do have some genuine concern. Do you think our incoming chief executive understands these challenges? And are you giving him a copy of your book? <laughs> <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> But I'm sure, I think, uh, the incoming executive, I think uh, he uh, ex he also expressed, I think, the, the importance, I think, to give an opportunity to young people, which is very good. And then they also recognize the poverty is a real problem. So I do hope he can get all the support he could have, I think, to make Hong Kong uh, really turn into a new chapter. And then I do hope every one of us can do a fish. I always say that uh, sharing is caring. I mean, we are the fortunate one. If we have the opportunity to share with someone who is less fortunate. I mean, if everyone is doing this, actually we only have 23% of people poor, right? So we have 73%, they are not that poor. So if this 73%, everyone is doing something, it actually it can make a difference. See a question here. Yeah, hi. thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Uh, so much great information. You're bringing a lot of hope. <laughs> so, 
Thanks for that. Um, just a, a question about the spatial mismatch that you identified there, especially between sort of jobs and housing opportunities, right? For people with lower incomes. It seems like a lot of policy work focuses on the alleviation side of the back end of that, right? So how do we find ways to put jobs in places where people live or give cash benefits or wealth away from other clients, things to come, et cetera, to sort of alleviate poverty in the back end? I wonder if you could speak a little bit to either efforts that are existent or maybe why they're not existent to sort of work the other end of that spectrum from a policy perspective. So why can we not uh, work on making housing more affordable in places where jobs are uh, or, or that sort of thing, or, or is that already happening? No, I think the the government they realize the problem. I always say that when you're solving this problem, you're either you bring the jobs to the people where they live, or you make it easier to bring the people where they live to go to the work, right? So actually, what the government has been doing, provide some transport subsidies, I mean, for the people, are they will be moved across district, are they to find the jobs and then uh, make the transport less affordable. These are the good things. So so and I think it is some sort of, um, uh, in our data, it showed that for those people who are willing to travel across district, they actually they earn more. But as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, you know, but this is actually at the expense of, I think, of their personal time, their health, and their family relationship. So I think I wish, as I, I mentioned a couple of times, the local metropolis, I mean, it is claimed that the people who live there who can generate sufficient work to support, I think, the population. I think that's the most ideal thing. I think the housing, yes, I mean, I show you the graph, but those people who are on the public housing, it, they are actually, uh, they can save money. I think uh, they are talking about, in Hong Kong, 30% of the people, I think, will be in the public housing, which is really, very different, I mean, from any high income city, I mean, what you see, except in Singapore, you know, but, 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 but then, but, in Hong Kong, I mean, the affordability, 23, I mean, 23 years, not 23 months, 23 years you know, to buy an apartment. You know? And But I'm also very surprised, how come any new apartment, there's a long queue, you know, I mean, to get the, I mean where the money come from? You know? yeah, uh, somebody in Zoom was just asking, you had monthly income trend figures for uh, 91 in 2001 and 2011. I was wondering if you had anything more recent, like we know what it is. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the 2021, 20, I think the census data, they are coming soon. Coming out soon. Yeah, so, but, but it actually it also, they uh, some increase the improvement. So, so I think I'm, I'm not saying uh, Hong Kong is doing bad, the Hong Kong is doing good, uh, but we, uh, in terms of the wages, it, I think it is pushing up now. But because I think the other end, the other side, they're getting even more expensive, but it's still it's the latte index is still uh, is not any is not improving. Now. So, so it's still very expensive. And what are the economic prospects if they continue with the current zero COVID kind of lockdowns? The airport is basically deserted now. Uh, my apartment building is half empty because you've had a lot of expat teachers leaving and that kind of thing. I mean, how long can this go on? Well, I think it is a very, very difficult situation. I think uh, I think the COVID itself, I think we just have to, um, if we maintain this, I think we will be losing a lot of opportunities. I mean, um, as you see, I mean, uh, people, they are really moving. They're moving to Singapore, they're moving to some other country. So I think somehow, I think we have to somehow to come to terms with it. I mean, uh, 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 can we somehow make some compromise? You know, I think to maintain, uh, uh, I think this international net is very really important. I mean, that is what Hong Kong to be different from, I think, uh, from other cities in China. I think mean, if we lose that sort of uniqueness, I mean, this sort of so called super connected, I think we will be, we are, we are dysfunctioning ourselves. I think in order not to be able to contribute much, as much as we like to the development of our country. I, I think that's a very really important. I mean, that is, that is a place I always say that, like our university, we like to make Hong Kong University to serve our country. Why? 
Why do we do that? We need to make our university as good as possible. I mean, to be a role model, I mean, to be champion in other science in different areas that make us benefit. The, the, uh, question. I was going to say one of, one of the interesting things about Hong Kong is they do, it's a wealthy city. In a lot of ways in terms of foreign exchange reserves in terms of infrastructure etc but you still have some of these persistent problems like homelessness in hong kong i mean is, there's a disparity there somehow why does the government have so much in foreign exchange reserves and then not spending it i want to write this letter to the king <laughs> <laughs> so, so i always say we do have some structural structural problem that this is a structural problem and uh, when we uh, look at the data, we see the people have from move out from poverty to non poverty. But it doesn't matter how it goes, there's still a certain proportion of people who are being trapped in the divorced one, the new, the new migrants, the uh, low skilled worker, and then the elderly one. They are one who are being trapped in. So if you do not get right into the problem, give them some support, give them some training, provide the child care, give them a job, then they will have a chance then to move off from, from the poverty. But at this moment, I think we tend to dish out the money, I think, universally, and somehow, I think um, it has not really Optimize the impact, I think, of this financial input. If you spend $300 billion, actually, we can do a lot of things, my dear friend. So, so when you look at the poverty, it actually it doesn't take $300 billion to leave everybody above the poverty line. It's also only $20 billion. But as I said before, above the poverty number, it doesn't mean that your life is good. I see a question up here. Yeah, uh, I want to pick up on a connection between um, the book poverty and things of affluence by Lynn Grusted. Uh, he kind of looked at like some of the foundations to the way that Hong Kong was uh, the structural system that supported some of this inequality that's happened over the years. Um, the idea that the government kind of created policy on you know, the, the general economic prosperity here in the city, uh, the rising tide, the all boats sort of idea, uh, some of the cultural aspects where it was connected to societal support within the family unit, how that plays out. Um, so less of a government responsibility and more of, you know, the individual and the family and society responsibility to care and support each other. Um, and then connecting that with some of the, the data that you're showing here on, you know, the issue that we see within the city, that inequality has continued, um, and even though there is some of that economic sort of prosperity that we see here in the city, it's not necessarily flowing across, despite the attributions to different things that we would expect should have a positive impact on education. Right? You showed the slide that education, despite that increasing, there's a net decrease in uh, wages and income that people earn. Uh, when you look at like the pre intervention poverty rates, that's actually increasing. Um, as opposed to going the other way around. So when you connect that into kind of like the future of Hong Kong uh, and the idea that it's going to be part of like a larger greater Bay area, uh, in one stream of thought, you could probably say, well, it's going to be beneficial, right? Because it's going to give us more opportunity, there's more business, there's more, um, I guess, you know, space for people to get uh, income and uh, jobs, but it may be societal opportunities. But if you look at the same trends that you're highlighting, there's every possibility as well that business um, may continue to be concentrated amongst the smaller population of people, um, and not necessarily benefit you know the lower population of the middle class, which is getting squeezed. So if I was to ask the question, when you think about you know, this future, um, are there elements within policy that the government needs to start to address that would actually kind of like take into consideration some of these areas? Um, and are you starting to see any of that movement happen towards that? I think I, if, I think one way to re-address the income inequality, the inequality, I really like to see more work should be done on the minimum wages. 
uh, more work needs to be done to st stop the outsourcing work, especially with the no skill pe the no skill people. But the no skill people, they are the one who will be who are most vulnerable. They are the one who cannot um, protect themselves. I mean, even right when you talk about the cleaner, the security guard, whether you bring them private the government or from the outsourcing company. I mean, the differences of the salary will be 30 or 40 percent. Where have the money gone? This guy is doing exactly the same thing. One is being employed by the government, the other is outsourcing company. Of course, the money goes to the outsourcing company. For goodness sakes. Why should we do this? But then the people say, that, well, that's just a trend. I mean, that is the world, the global trend, outsourcing the world. Outsourcing the work, it doesn't mean that outsourcing your responsibility. And especially, I do think that the government, they do have a responsibility to protect those people who cannot protect themselves. And you are the one who are doing the outsourcing. There are 60,000 of the outsourcing work being employed by the government and providing the services to the government. Why can't you think about when you give them a proper job and then you're helping 60,000, not only the workers, their family as well? So I think there are certain things that I think in their policy wise, I think the government can do something. And then, um, then after that, then you move up the housing problem. I mean, I still don't understand why they're still selling so much land in the high tech after 25 years, I mean, they still have not finishing in selling them. For goodness sake, I mean, the, we have moved the the kind of 25 years ago, right? They still haven't done a job, no? So I think mean, that how can you improve the efficiency, the, uh, making the land for the housing, how to uh, do a expedience this of processes and then make sure there's a housing segment for the low income group. There's a housing segment um, for those rich people. It is fine. I don't mind. I mean, you can live in your bungalow with your, in your $100 million up, up the apartment. It's okay. But as long as we see those people who stay in the split housing, these cage houses, if their living, uh, if their living around can be improved, I think that will really help a lot. Not only having the, the heather, having the children too. There's a lot of children, they are depressed. And of course they are depressed. Uh, I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, they are staying in a uh, 100 square feet apartment. And now we are hiring the people to provide a country, I mean, to these young people. No, yes, they are important, but at the same time, solve their housing problem is solve a lot of it. Let's take two more and then get people out in time. Uh, one in the room and then one in the Zoom. Okay, uh, just a quick one to uh, to complement your figures. You said uh, let the figures speak. So I, 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 I'd like to point out that uh, uh, if one look at the budget, well, you actually have to do some calculation on the supplement and so on. Actually, uh, the government has spent 3.8% of GDP on social welfare. Uh, that is probably the lowest compared to, to, to uh, other uh, developed countries. Notably, is the average is uh, for about 10%, 30% or something. Now, this doesn't mean that we are terrible, or, or maybe we are completely different. Uh, but by the way, education doesn't fare very well either. Education is only 3.7% of GDP. But at 3.8% of GDP, for social welfare, actually it's not a lot of money. But the government never put figures in terms of GDP. In other, everywhere else in the international in the world, they put it in terms of GDP. But, but they always say, oh, we, we uh, $6 million, billion dollars, and uh, so many percent over last, over last year and so on. So from, from that part, it's actually um, playing with figures. The, the ordinary public would be impressed, would, would think, okay, but well, there's a great increase. But if you look at the percentage of GDP, 20% is not particularly impressive. Is there any excuse that any excuse that we could be different from other developed countries? Well, I don't uh, I think one thing uh, 
uh, it is true that the Hong Kong people, they actually, even some of them, they are entitled to receive the CSSA. They do go for the CSSA. They try to earn the money for themselves. So I don't mind that we spend less in social welfare. I, know, I hope we spend even less because the people, they do not have to rely on the CSSA. But you're right, but when you look at the GDP factors, we are not uh, any higher than the other country. But you know, when you see the Western country, a lot of countries, they are in debt. Do we like to have that? Do you want to borrow the money? I mean, to live at present? I always say, we do not create a problem for our descendants, right? I think so. So, what we really want to do is just to re now, I think we do have sufficient resources. I mean, as I said, we do have sufficient resources to do a better job. But at this moment, we just do not do a better job. And we bring these own resources. And then we do not, I mean, if, even when you spend more, I'm not sure. That is the most effective uh, into tackling, I mean, the sort of poverty problem, I think, you know. And uh, Stella Zhang in the Zoom asked, uh, well, she thanks you for the talk, and she has two questions, one quick one. She says, who's got the main responsibility for poverty alleviation in Hong Kong, the government or the community? And then her second question is, would it be more effective to replace public housing mechanism with housing subsidies? Because the uh, subsidy might allow people to basically choose where they want to live in a more convenient location, whereas public housing is limited and not flexible. I think everybody has a fair share of the poverty problem. As I say, who's still my, my lot? You know? I think some of the business, I think sometimes they can be, uh, do not uh, try to uh, don't make so much money, or they try to increase the wages of the workers. I mean, the co sharing, right? I mean, why this guy earns six billion dollars as a chief executive? I mean, why this uh, poor um, security guy only a hundred thousand? Come on. I mean, we can be free. So, I, so I think everybody, so I think instead of pointing fingers to someone, but I think it is somehow that we have to do it. But the government, whatever. I say they do have the responsibility. I mean, they're rectifying some of the wrong. Some of this, there's a structural problem, the policy problem, some injustice problem, some sort of the coercion, I mean, with the business sector, the high land prices, these are the problems. And then well, housing, I think, we give them the choices. Public housing, uh, give them the homes of this, I think mean, we just, we just, just, uh, it's not one to the others. Be flexible. Last question for me is where can people buy a copy of your book? Oh, <laughs> I think our, our library is very good. I mean, uh, we have the G copy, we have the link, and then, uh, well, I don't mean you have to buy. Nobody will get rich by selling the book. <laughs> so, so, so I think you're most welcome to make use of the library copies and all the things, but if you do like to buy a copy, you're more than welcome to. If they buy a copy, you can sign it for them. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> well, the summer is coming up. You need your summer reading list. You might be going on vacation. It might be a good book to take with you. So, um, I'm not going to definitely put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> want to thank you, uh, Professor Paul Yip, for being the first uh, in, uh, in-person library speaker of 2022. And thank the library for putting this event on. Thank you.